Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Vietnam War. I am Mike B. And today we're going to be taking a look at something you guys have been hounding me in the comments about. And uh, anyway, we're going to uh, be taking a look at some of the basic field equipment that the United States Army soldier, primarily the Marines, eventually kind of went to this, but that's a different topic. Uh, the Army soldier would, would have been wearing from about 1965 all the way through the end. Uh, some stuff did change, but we'll talk about that. But this is going to be mainly what you see. Now, this is my stripped down, absolute bare bones gear for uh, my, I guess you could say, impression for reenacting or whatever, just to kind of have a uniform that's pretty accurately representing what the average uh, Joe would have been carrying. So, we've got the 1956, the M1956 gear. And um, I don't know if you guys don't know about it or whatever, or if you're just curious to see what it looks like on someone. So we'll kind of go, I'll kind of treat it as that you don't know anything about it. So if you do, just enjoy kind of the, the um, aesthetics and, you know, not myself, but the gear. But, uh, all right, sidetracked. All right, I'm going to stay on track on this video. I swear to God, guys, one of these times. So basically, in 1956, after the Korean War, the military saw a need for, like, a different kind of equipment and um, more ergonomic and practical, um, kind of getting away from the World War II stuff in the 1945 gear. And of course the Marines were still using that, but uh, the Army said, okay, well, what would make the most sense? So they came out with the 1956 system. And in 1961 to 65, mainly around 1961, they improved upon the 1956 uh, gear. Um, some of it didn't get improved on, but a lot of it did. So this is technically what I refer to as the 5661 kit. Um, that's not necessarily the correct term, but that's just what I call it because a lot of it was upgraded in 1961. So we'll start out with, again, this is the basic setup. Um, this isn't like any extra gear. We'll be doing that as the series goes on and we'll eventually get to like the entire kit of a, an army soldier on patrol. So what we've got is the, we'll start out with just the belt, all right? The 1956 belt. So it came out, it had this little button style closure, um, similar to the World War II belts. And uh, it had what's called a horizontal weave, right? So that means that the weave just looks like it's going in horizontal lines. And in around 1964, 65, sometimes even earlier, um, you can see examples, they started using it, um, it was still canvas at this point, they started making the vertical weave, so the weave looked like you know vertical lines instead of this. This is a horizontal one. You see both styles throughout the entire conflict. And then later on, they used the uh, vertical weave um, nylon belts in like 1967 on with the new gear. But you're going to mainly see the canvas belts like this. Um, either one would be accurate for um, 1965 on for Army. That's why I just, I just chose to do the horizontal one because, you know, it adds some variety of what you would have seen out in the field. Now we'll get to the actual M1956 Universal Arms Pouch. So this is going to be the main ammo pouch throughout the entire Vietnam War. It's made out of canvas. Uh, the early ones, like, like this, um, had a reinforcement, kind of a stiffener in the front. And they were actually made for the M14 rifle. But they call it the Universal Arms Pouch because it could fit M14, FAL, G3 mags, all that stuff. And basically any other kind of like rifle magazine at that time that was like 20 rounds at around this size. So I only have wooden blocks in here right now because um, I happened to lose all my 20 rounders. Um, and a few years ago, I ended up getting kind of screwed over by somebody, but I'm in the process of reacquiring a crap ton of USGI 20 round magazine. So there's no need to, I mean, I can, I can show you what's in here, but uh, it's just wooden blocks from when I was in high school, um, just to kind of fill it up. But it would fit three um, 20 round M16 mags um, side by side. You can fit 20 or three 20 rounders in each pouch. Standard issue was two pouches, but um, somebody like myself, like a bigger dude or somebody that carried most of their stuff on their rucksack would have probably tried to acquire more of these. And for on a later video, warm bandoliers. That's why I'm saying this is the basic gear. So you got three, six, nine, 12, 20 round magazines. Um, so you got 240 rounds there. Plus you're probably gonna have 14 more magazines or seven at least in the um, bandoliers that they would carry. Because ammunition was pretty, um, pretty needed out in the field and you couldn't always get a resupply. So all the guys I talked to that were out in the, out in the bush and um, looking at interviews and stuff have said that they carried as much as they physically could handle because they had to counter or factor in for food and everything like that. So you'd see, I've seen a lot of pictures of guys wearing three and four of the pouches and then they have their canteens on their rucks mainly. And um, they might have one 
which I've got and we'll talk about next on their belt just to have quick access to, but ammunition was a really big priority as far as the equipment goes. So that's why I've got four. And as you can see, I'll be getting more of these too. These are just the little replicas. Each pouch could hold two M29 lemon grenades, they were called. This is the uh, most popular grenade, fragmentation grenade used in Vietnam. They were using the Mark II at the beginning, the pineapple grenade, and then they used the M67 at the very end, the baseball grenade. But this is going to be probably the most common style you can see. Um, inert, obviously, you can buy these a lot of places. I usually paint them all of drab because that's more realistic to what they would have looked like instead of the you know raw metal and blue training spoons that they had. So that's what I do for the impression. They would have had writing on them too, but I don't have a stencil and obviously I'm too lazy. But yeah, so each pouch holds two of those. So I could, I could hold a total of eight hand grenades and 12 magazines just on my belt. Um, so that, that's, pretty, that's pretty good for firepower and explosive capability. Now we'll go to the canteen. Uh, this is the 1956 canteen pouch. It's just got a canvas reinforcement trim. And it's lined with, um, actually, I think it's wool fleece, and they went to a uh, synthetic fleece later on. And the later, the later canteen covers are going to have the nylon trim instead of the canvas. And that was in kind of a transition period in 1966 and 67. They were only made for a little bit. Also, I forgot to mention, these were for about, uh, I don't know, less than a year, around a year, made shorter. And they were actually designed specifically for the M16 magazines. But they are really hard to come by. They're, they're just shorter than these, you can tell in size if you put them next to each other. These are all the, the standard 56 pouches, so they're still the tall tall design. Some of these are later because they don't have the reinforcement, but whatever. Uh, canteens, uh, early Vietnam, you're gonna see a lot of aluminum canteens still. The 1956 style looked like the 1944 style or whatever with the little uh, rim on it. And then in 1962 or 61, they came out with the plastic canteen, which is you know what I've gotten here. And the canteen cup, which I actually don't have, the T handle was still used, so the same one since World War I. Um, they were just stamped differently, and then in 65, they, they quit stamping the years on them from what I've seen. So it was the same design as the World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. They'll use that, and they went to the butterfly handle ones, the modern ones, later. So I don't have mine in here, which I definitely should. I'm just going to use a World War II one because they definitely would have been issued those. Same thing. So we'll move along here, and... This is more of a weapon than the basic equipment, but I've got the M7 bayonet for the M16 and the M8A1 scabbard. You would have seen the M8 and, and M8A1 scabbards, but uh, this is just the M8A1 because it's easier to find and they're a lot cheaper. So, um, yeah, each guy, it was, it was kind of up to them or their unit, unit's SO, or standard operating procedure if they were to carry these, where they were to carry them. A lot of people carried fighting knives, um, didn't use the bayonets, but a lot of people swore by these as a fighting knife and a bayonet. So again, that's very um, kind of dependent on the individual and the unit. Up here, you've got the uh, first aid pouch, which went from the, the 1942 style, or actually the 1910 style that it was designed off of. Um, the 1942 style Carlisle bandage pouch, which we're actually still using in Vietnam, but very early on. It went to this, which is just, it held a single field dressing in here or whatever you wanted to put in there. Mainly a field dressing would be in here, and these are placed either on the belt or a lot of people put them up here because it's quick to get them and you can use them. You don't want to have a lot of stuff on your firing shoulder. That's the thing that I see with a lot of Vietnam reenactors is they'll put flashlights and grenades and stuff like up here where if you had, if you have a rifle, right, and you're trying to put it up here, this is going to get in the way. And this is something that's still, you know, true today. And I tell the Vietnam vets support me on this is, this shoulder is usually always clear, especially when you're on patrol and you could you know, run into an enemy at any point because you don't want to have anything possibly interfering with the uh, shouldering of your weapon. And uh, so that, that's something that you see a lot of reenactors do wrong. Um, in the movies, sometimes they do that wrong. They have flashlights and stuff here. You're going to keep everything basically on your left shoulder. Um, that, you know, if you're, if you're a, a right-handed shooter, if you're a left-handed shooter, obviously your stuff's going to be over here. Now let's talk about the suspenders. So these are the H suspenders, they're called as you can see, and uh, they're made out of canvas. They really didn't change a whole lot throughout the entire war until they went to the 1967 version, which were all made out of nylon. I don't have an original set of that, so we're just gonna be talking about this today. And they come down and they hook up to the 19, what was originally the 1956 butt pack. This is a 61 version, so it's a little bit bigger than the 56, and it's got a rubberized lining in it, which the 56 didn't have. And some of them, the later ones from the mid 60s, started to have these, uh, little name plate things on, these little plastic things. 
So that was pretty interesting. And the suspenders hooked directly to that, so it supports your, your gear. It's load-bearing equipment, which is what it's designed to do. So we got that. The butt pack is actually pretty cool. It's like a nice day pack. But if you're going out for more than a day, you're going to probably want to bring your rucksack, which will be covered in another video. So that's basically the, I'm trying to remember if I got everything correctly. So yeah, some of these things, like I said, the canteen, uh, they started trimming or putting the trim on as like nylon um, in like 1966. But by that time, the 67 gear was coming out and it was all nylon anyway. So they just kind of scrapped that and said it was more effort than it's worth and just made the new stuff. But this is basically, oh, this, the M57 Claymore Clacker. This is not a basic common thing. This is just something that I have on here. I've seen pictures of guys and videos of guys that have these. Um, yeah, one comes with each Claymore, but if you've got a bad one that doesn't work or whatever, you want to have a good one. And some guys would carry them here just to have quick access to them. It might not be, you know, what you've seen, but I've definitely seen it, photographic, video evidence. Um, people have told me. So that's why I have that up there. You're free to do whatever you want and, you know, whatever. This is just a little addition to the, the impression that I have. So... That's the absolute basic 1956 gear. Again, the basic would only have two ammo pouches. I have four on mine because I'm a bigger dude, and I can actually fit that. Smaller guys weren't able to fit as much stuff on their belt because they're not as big around, and these depend on how much space you've got. So I'd actually, being a bigger guy too, I would be carrying more ammo for other people as well, more than likely, or be an M60 uh, machine gunner. But since I'm portraying like a team leader or a squad leader, I would probably just have ammo for myself and for my guys as a bigger dude. So it kind of works out that way. Um, again, pictures, videos, you can see all this stuff. So then uh, for the gear, the helmet is actually included in the gear, right? For the basic field gear. You got the camouflage cover on it, right? And the elastic band, just the M1 helmet. And that's what most people were issued. Their helmet variation, helmet cover variations. Sure, a little bit, but most, about 95% of the people in Vietnam they had a cover on, we're wearing the, the Mitchell pattern, the vine leaf cover, the reversible one. Um, extra stuff, that was, again, on an individual basis. Some guys didn't have anything. Some guys had, you know, about the amount of shit stuff that I have in my helmet band. Uh, just like bug juice, stuff you want to get at really quick. Uh, sometimes they put cigarettes up there if they were walking through water so it wouldn't get all sweaty and disgusting. But then if it was raining, you're screwed, etc., etc. But I'll talk about that in a separate video, too. That's a, that's a pretty popular issue. And then you've got the Jungle Fatigue uniform, which I was talking about. i got the third pattern shirt on, first pattern pants. You're going to see them throughout the entire conflict as well. Not in the numbers you would think, but um, I like these just because they're, they fit me really well. They're comfortable, and they got the leg ties that are designed to actually... They go up to this little loop underneath your nutsack, and they provide support for if you've got a lot of weight in your pockets. It keeps the pocket directly off of your, or supposed to keep it directly off your leg to prevent like chafing and uncomfortable stuff like that. So then we've got the jungle boots down here. These are the third patterns that we talked about in the other video. And the reason I've got my, uh, a lot of cat hair. Oof. Disgusting. The reason I got my uh, pants rolled up is A, it says in the instruction booklet for the jungle boots that you're supposed to wear your pants outside of the boot. And B, this is about what 90% of people have told me, what I've seen on videos and seen in pictures. They would just roll them up here. And I said, well, what about bugs and snakes and stuff? They said, you know what? It was always hot. There weren't always bugs and snakes, you know, because we weren't always out humping. And even when we were, we learned to deal with that. We'd rather, you know, have some sort of air circulation and, you know, cool down a little bit faster than actually, you know, worrying about bugs and snakes. I was like, oh, that's pretty hardcore. Because I definitely worry about bugs and snakes. But... Yeah, so that's why they were worn like this, um, kind of to the top of the boot a little bit. And then, obviously, most of this stuff looks pretty new because it is. I'll be uh, wearing it out. And they would have had newer stuff, you know, every once in a while. They got a resupply. They would have had new boots, new uniforms, and then go out and destroy it all. And then, you know, rinse and repeat. So, all right. Um, yeah, that pretty much, that's pretty much the basic actual infantryman's kit, uh, Army infantryman's kit from the uh, mid you know, or we'll say 1965, because yeah, this is pretty pretty much 1965 to 66 gear all the way through the end. This is what you'd have seen. Very basic. Again, this isn't gospel. This isn't what everybody wore. This is what I chose to wear based on my research. So again, your mileage may vary. You can, as long as you're basing it off of historical evidence, I mean, you'll find a lot of things you can do with this. Everybody's, uh, everybody's different. Everybody's got their own preference. Um, 
And again, this is a absolute lightweight. If you're just going out for a few hours on a patrol, this is what you're gonna be wearing. It's not like a multi-day thing. You're gonna have your rucksack at that point and a bunch of other stuff. Also, I don't have the weapon, um, so I was just kind of making this a gear video. We'll get into the weapons and stuff later. But, all right, sorry this video was so long, but you guys have been nagging me, and I told you I'd dig this stuff out eventually, and went out in the freezing cold and dug through all my stuff in the garage and pulled this out that I haven't used in, oh, probably seven years. So, yeah, hope you enjoyed this video, guys. If you're new to the channel and you made it this far in the video, make sure you give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for more content like this. I'll have this series going pretty much forever. Um, there's so many things I can talk about. And then consider supporting the channel. You can do that directly through the link in, my, uh, in the description of the video. If not, that's totally fine. I appreciate you watching. And, uh, yeah, let me know what you think down in the comments. If you got any questions, I'll try to answer them. Uh, again, I'm not, like, a total expert, but I, I know what I know, and I can probably help you out. So... Thanks for watching, everybody, and we'll see you on the next video.